let's see if that's working. Yeah. Yeah, something's coming up there. That's good. And then let's see if that's not. I need to switch off the sound before I get the feedback. Good. Good. So if you're <laughs> watching this on YouTube, we're about well, we'll start in about two or three, two or three minutes. Um, we'll get going with the with the seminar. Good. I'll I'll let you introduce me then, Patrick. I'll put you on the the spotlight video. Um. Is that now? Okay. So welcome everyone to this lecture by Professor David Sumter from Uppsala University and also Hammarby EF. Uh, I'm Patrick Lambrix. Uh, I will host this lecture, which is part of the machine learning. Okay, I think I'll start over. There was some uh, back noise from the YouTube channel here, I think. Okay, yeah, that's... Okay. <laughs> so, welcome everyone to uh, David Sumter's uh, lecture, professor at Uppsala University and also uh, working for Hamabu EF. So I'm Patrick Lambrix. Uh, I will host this lecture, which is part of the machine learning seminar series at Linköping University, as well as a lecture in my sports analytics course. Uh, David published several books, and the one that's mostly connected to this lecture is, well, Soccer Magics. 
Um, he's also one of the organizers of the Friends of Tracking YouTube channel. Uh, very interesting. And I know that uh, several of the people who are taking this course are actually following these lectures that uh, you guys are putting out there. So David, very interested in hearing you talk about the work that you presented or that your group presented at uh, MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference this year. All well, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, well, first for the invite to come to Lynn Chirping and do it. And then secondly, for the opportunity to do it in this way, both over Zoom to you guys and um, over YouTube. So any of you who are, watch who are on the Zoom one, if you just watch it on YouTube and come back in for questions, that's fine. Um, that's fine too. If you're watching it on YouTube and you want to put some questions, you can put them in the chat and I'll try and answer them at the end of the end of the talk. But I'm, now I'm just going to go like I would give a normal seminar, even though it feels a bit strange to be doing this sitting in my wife's study. But um, I'll start by getting my slides up here. So. This, this is work I have done together with um, three other people in a really interesting project. So my research is funded this year by SSF, who agreed to finance me to work with Hammerby Football Club, trying to do football analytics right inside the club. And it's an amazing experience because they gave me access to sort of an access as to what was going on inside Hammerby, that I could work together with Stefan Bilbo and the manager, with um, Jesper Janssen, the, the sporting director, Ola Larsson, who's the technical director, is one of the people who's, who's really got me involved with this thing. But they gave me the opportunity to work very closely with Hammerby on a research project um, combining mathematics and football. And in that project, I started with, what, uh, in that project, um, we soon brought in Fran Peralta, who was a master's student, very interested in football and wanted to see if he could work on football analytics as well. And so he started this work as, as a master's student and is now employed as Hammerby as their data scientist. And we also got the chance to work with Javier Fernandez, who works at FC Barcelona, and he's done a lot of the sort of groundwork on pitch control, which I'll come back to. And he worked very closely with us in this project. And very nice, we got a lot of input in the early stages, in particular working work together with the players um, from Pablo Panache's Acre. Uh, and Pablo has been really, um, really helpful in, in everything that we do. Really, I've learned a lot of football, both from both from Pablo actually, and also from Stefan Bilborn, the manager, and um, Jorke Bjorklund as well. So, um, this is really a big collaboration between between us. And I think I want to say here that Fran did the majority of the programming work in this project. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start with what I think are the principles of football. So there are three spatial principles of football, and that's what we try and develop in our modeling. I call the first of these, I'm going to go through them one at a time. The first of these is past probability. And it's the probability of success when you play a pass in football. And what's shown, some difficulty with my mouse here, what's shown here is the, uh, the player with the ball is actually here, number 17. And what's shown is all the places that he can possibly play a pass to. And green areas mean he can pass there. Red areas mean that if he passes there, an opposition player will get there first. So the green team is Hammerby. Um, this is Vida, our striker. He's got the ball and he can pass to any of these green marked areas. And that's the idea of pass probability. I'm going to go into the details of how we model this later. Then we have an idea called pass impact. And that's the danger that you produce by selecting a certain pass. So if you look closely at this figure of the pass impact, you'll see from where the blue spot is, pointing at my screen, where the blue spot is, you see a red area and down to a white area. Now, red means more dangerous, yellow means semi-dangerous, and white means dangerous, not, uh, not dangerous at all. So typically, and I'm also going to look into how we find this model, typically a pass towards the red areas nearer to the goal is more dangerous in football. It's not rocket science, but it's statistically 
shown that those types of passes are more dangerous. And then finally, the third type of measure that I'm interested in is something called pitch control. And this is quite similar to pass probability, but it's slightly different. In pitch control, we're interested in who will get to the ball first if it just suddenly appeared at a particular space. And you'll see that in this particular um, particular example, the, um, the red team, which I think is Kalmar, Kalmar have most of the control of the area outside of their box. And this isn't something that we like if we're playing for Hammerby. We would like to have more control over that area. So the uh, red area is controlled by Kalmar and the green area is controlled by Hammerby. Just to summarize, is maximized by players moving to maximize own or other teammates pass success. Pass impact is maximized by occupying a point on the pitch that is maximally dangerous. And pitch control is maximized by moving to the place where you'll, you'll get and control the ball. Okay, um, just to say that I didn't come up with all of these, these spatial principles myself. And a recent video on the Friends of Tracking YouTube channel by William Spearman actually gives a series of references. If you look in the notes under that, you get a series of references of, of the different work that has, has gone towards building up these principles. But for me, I think that these are the, these are pretty much, they're not the final story, but they're the, the sort of principles of football, the mathematical principles of football. Now there's not just spatial principles, there's another type of principle. And this is what I think about as the playing principle. And this comes, there's, there's various ways of thinking about principles in football, but I like to think about it in terms of three zones. And this is something that Xavier really, uh, from Barcelona, really contributed because in Barcelona training, they often talk about three zones and how you should behave in these different types of three zones. The first zone is the intervention zone. So that is the zone that's nearest to the player with the ball. This is a player with a ball here. This is represented from a top down view. and if you've got the ball, basically the rule is you should keep on the ball. Then there, outside of this area, there's another zone called the mutual help zone. Now inside that zone, the idea is you open up passing lanes so other players can pass to you. There's various things you might want to do, but this is where you're really actively involved with the play inside the mutual help zone. Then further out, there's the cooperation zone. And here is more to do with tactical decisions about how you're going to occupy so when you're thinking as a player, you can think in terms of these three different zones and what you should do in each of those three different zones. I'm going to come back to what we might say that you should do um, soon, but that's, that's how you should think about football playing. This is another example for exactly the same thing that we looked at for the spatial principles, intervention zone, mutual help zone, and cooperation zone. Actually, I think the cooperation zone should stretch out all over the pitch, but you get the idea that it's first from where the ball is, is where, where you should act as if you're in the cooperation zone. What I liked about this model when we started talking about it with Barcelona was that it's very similar to how we look at animal behavior. And I've previously done all of my research on looking at collective behavior of animals. And when we look at movement of fish and birds, we often talk about different zones of interactions. We talk about alignment zones, repulsion zones, and attraction zones. And it turns out description or a good starting description of football is to describe it in terms of these three zones. And what I really like about these principles is that basically they connect together the geometry of the maths of the game, and that's what I'm going to show during the talk, they connect together geometry and maths of the game to how coaches actually talk about it. Just to go back to what I said about animal behavior, I worked for a long time um, looking at different types of animal behavior from ants to birds and fish and that was this way I'm talking about working here is very similar to how we actually worked with the animal behavior. We set down various principles that we thought species of animals interacted with each other, we built models to describe those and we tried to get more and more insight into how the animals are behaving and actually when I talk to football coaches I actually see them a little bit about like the biologists that I used to talk to about animal behavior. The difference is football coaches can actually manipulate their study 
And so they can manipulate the football players and get them to do various things. While the, um, actually you can do experimental manipulation as well if you're a biologist, but there's a different way in which you can manipulate things as a coach than you can as a biologist. There's a very strong parallel in how we work as, or how I work as an applied mathematician uh, with now with football coaches as how I worked as an applied mathematician together with biologists. This is just to give you some idea of a few of the things that we um, modeled working in collective animal behavior. The, um, just a why we worked with all different types of species from fish up here at the top, uh, well, fish, uh, fish up there. It's not going to do it. Fish up here at the top, cicada calling, chickens, locusts, even human crowds, sheep, prawns. Uh, more, some more humans, pigeons, ants. And we always use this type of approach of building up some principles that we thought that the animals interacted with and using um, a combination of models and experiment to test, to test how that fitted together. And that same approach is what we're going to use to try and model football. Okay, what I want to do now is I want to take a little bit of a step back and I want to think about the first principled approach to football because I think one of the models that came up first in football is a model called expected goals. And use expected goals in the principles, the spatial principles I talked about now, it does underlie the methods where, in which expected goals was developed, underlie a lot of how we actually, actually model things when we're looking for a more collective behavior type of principle. So I'm gonna start by going through, from my perspective, what I think is the theory of expected goals. So the idea of expected goals, yeah, I had this little video which said the idea of, whoa. Per Firmino, che tocca um, you can still hear me the video, I hope. And so what the idea of expected goals is, is it measures the quality of the shot. And I took up these two goals in particular, uh, one by Manet for Liverpool and one by Gareth Bale against Liverpool. And I often bring up, well, which of these goals is best? Now, the way we see it from expected goals is that the best goal here is actually the one from Manet because he is in a much better shooting position. He's in a place where he can't miss. And so we might not call it the, the, the best, but the thing is that he has managed to get himself into a position where he will score probably 90 times out of 100 from that position. While the goal from Bale, although he manages to score it, it wasn't a great chance. It's a lot of luck. The goalkeeper wasn't having his best day and he managed to get the ball in. And so the expected goal of these two shots is very different. The expected goal for Manet is much higher than the expected goal um, for Gareth Bale. And what we, how I can say this is, is what we do is we look at the data. And this is some data I like to use for La Liga from a few seasons back when Neymar was playing for Barcelona. And what's shown here is all of the shots taken by Messi, Neymar and Suarez. And the color of them is basically the probability that on an average day of football, they would have scored that shot. The black ring means that they scored the goal. And what you'll notice in particular for Suarez is that most of these shots are very close to the goal. They're, they're all inside the box apart from two which Messi has scored. And the basic rule is the closer you are to the goal, the more likely you are to score the goal. We're gonna get into some subtleties of that soon, but that's the basic rule. And that's not just because of how Barcelona play. If you look at um, Real Madrid in the same season, even Cristiano Ronaldo, he's all the way out here, he had something like 60 shots from outside the box and he scored two of them, if we take away the ones that are inside the D. And so he had a conversion rate of about 3% um, outside of the box. Gareth Bale has a slightly better rate, scoring two of them. But most of these goals come from inside the box. Even Cristiano Ronaldo scores most of his goals from um, close to the goal. So a good chance is one that's nearer to the goal and a poor chance is further away. Okay, so how do we know this? Well, this is where I want to get into how we see it as a mathematician. How we, how we see expected goals as a mathematician is we formulate a model. 
And that model, we always like to have, in maths, we like to have one parameter. And the parameter I use here is theta. And it's basically the angle to the face of the goal. So here's Bale's shot. It has a very small angle to the face of the goal. Here is Manet's shot. It has a very big angle to the face of the goal. And we can actually see that so often chances will have this, this angle and this angle are pretty are uh, the same. So there's actually a circle that comes round all of these chances, which um, gives the same angle uh, on, the circuit, um, on the circle to the goal. And so we can actually formulate a model where we use this angle to predict the probability of scoring. And you need to do a little bit of trigonometry first, but you can find here is, this is 7.32 is the um, width of the goal. If you take the X coordinate and the Y coordinate, Y being distance from the middle line of the pitch, you can actually work out what this angle is for the X, Y coordinates of the shot. You've got that. You can fit a probability of scoring as a function of this shot angle. So here I've plot the shot angle in degrees and I've, I've plotted first the dots of the frequency. I think this was for the um, German Bundesliga for one, um, for one season. I've plotted the frequency of particular goals, uh, the dots, and then the solid line here is a fitted logistic model to those points. So I do logistic regression and I can actually determine what the probability of scoring is as a function of shot angle. And you see, of course, these things can be misleading, but you can see there's a very good fit there. If you know the shot angle, you can calculate quite reliably, reliably the probability of goal. And this equation here, this probability of goal, this is actually in a, the expected goals. This is the expected goals for a shot given that particular angle. And then you end up with this very nice ring. You end up, uh, end up with these very beautiful rings, which tell you the 30% chance of scoring, the 15% chance of scoring, and a 7% chance of scoring um, from, from these different positions. So everything within the, inside this ring has a 7% chance. Everything within this ring has a 30% chance. And that's very nice. Turns out the model isn't 100% the best model that you can do. You can do a slightly better model if you include, for example, the X, and then you maybe include some sort of nonlinear combinations of the theta and the X, uh, the X being this, this distance out in this direction. You, you combine a nonlinear combination of them and you can get an even better model. So instead of rings, it's sort of these squashed, instead of circles, it's these sort of squashed rings that you get, which give the probability of scoring. And there's a slightly better chance of scoring out of here than would be predicted by the rings. And that's the logistic regression gives you that model. And that's basically what expected goals is. It's a logistic regression of on theta and X um, or various other parameters. You can then throw in other things you can throw in if they if they shot with their best foot, you can throw in if it came for a counter attack. Um, if you start to use tracking data, you can throw in the positions of the other players into the model. But the basic principle is to, is to fit um, some combination of these variables preferably using logistic regression because it's always nice to use a reliable model, but you can also just throw it into a neural network and do that type of fitting. And this, if you want to have a look at how these, how these things work, we, I, I did this um, for the Swedish national team, for the women's team um, for the World Cup. We have an app, 12 dot football analytics, where you can go in and look at the expected goals for various matches. We have data for the Premier League, for Alsvenskan, um, for the World Cups, and so you can go in and have a look at the quality of chances of various players um, during during these matches. Okay, so that's expected goals. The reason I want to do that is because it's the principle we then use in the next stage. And the next stage, yeah, um, before I say that, okay, I'm going to go into, before I go to the next stage. Now we have a principle, and this is what I really like expected goals. Now we have a principle that's both mathematical, it's fitted using a statistical model, it's grounded in coaching, it's the angle, the amount of the goal you can see, and it's something that sort of everyone understands. I hope that I can explain expected goals to anybody who's interested. You probably have to have an interest in football, but you can explain it to anybody what expected goals is. So then the next stage is, 
well, football isn't just shots, right? Football is more about getting the ball to the goal. So the next stage is to say, can we use the same philosophy of evaluating actions using some sort of machine learning, logistic regression type techniques? Can we use it to evaluate all other actions? And the idea here is to look at something called possession chains and pass action value. So what you do is sometimes it's called EPV, expected possession values, there's a load of different names for it. But the basic idea is to evaluate different actions that players perform in the same way as we evaluate um, expected goals. This, the first reference I have to this type of approach in football came from a paper called from Sarah Rudd that she presented, where she basically made a Markov chain formulation of where the ball goes to in different situations. And here I made a very simplified version of her model, but you have a probability of transitioning from midfield into the box, midfield into goal, to losing the ball and so on. And you can build up a model which looks at those transition probabilities. And if your particular player has better quality transition, player, transition probabilities than other players, then you can say that that's a, uh, that player is a better player. Um, that's a, the sort of basic idea. What we do is we do a thing called possession chains, as I mentioned. So we start off, we take all of the events that happened in a match, and we look at a sequence of passes, runs, passes, run. These also include intercepts. They also include the shots and so on. And we basically um, Build, break every football match down in possession chains. The definition of a possession chain is if the opposition touches the ball twice in a row, then we say the possession chain is broken and the opposition team begin their possession chain. And so every match over all of Allsvenskan, for example, or all of the Premier League, we break down everything into possession chains. Once we have all of the possession chains, we do the following thing. If we're interested in this pass, for example, the idea is we have a lot of similar passes and we want to know how many of those passes led to a goal. And it might happen that one out of 10 of these, this type of pass led to a goal. And then we call the, we would say that the value of that pass is one out of 10. So just to give an idea of how we do this technically, first we do a regression of whether a particular pass ends up in a shot. So this is the x1, y1, x2, y2 coordinates. So you can think about these are the types of passes that have gone. These are all the similar passes here. So what's the probability you get a shot based on that? And we do a linear regression. We do a, yes, we do a linear regression to work out the probability. Oh, no, we do a logistic regression to work out where you get the probability of a shot. Then we do a second regression to find out we get a goal given a shot. And so multiplying those two probabilities together gives the overall value of this type of pass. And that allows us to do exactly what I talked about in the beginning, and it allows us to give a value for every different pass. And that's why we say when we have the ball at this particular blue point here, that's why we say that passes to here are more valuable, is because when we've done these regressions, we found out that those passes are more likely to lead to a goal. And so you see even here a pass here, which can later lead to a cutback. They're difficult to make, but they're actually quite valuable. So it doesn't have to go directly into the goal. And so this allows us then to evaluate the value of every different pass. Give you some examples here. Again, you can look at this on the 12 website. This are from the, um, from the Women's World Cup from the Swedish national team. And you can see Aslani is with quite a lot of different pass, valuable passes. So basically I've thresholded here and picked out her most valuable passes. And they're often the passes into the box. They can be a long pass out to the wing. We've also given her some points for a dribble, for corners and so on. And so every pass is given a value in this way. And in that way you can actually value and you can rank players who is contributing the most to attack over the whole field. Give you an idea how this works in practice. See if this works um, uh, on the on the YouTube, but uh, I can see it anyway. We can see here is the points we give for a sequence of passes leading up to a shot for Liverpool. So Salah gets twenty four points for this dribble, fifty six points for a near assist, and since the um, 
since it's a miss, we give it the expected goals for the points. I'll show this video one more time to give you an idea about how we um, award the point. In the ball back there, it wasn't particularly dangerous area, actually. You get plus 26 points, 6% 6 chance of him scoring that particular chance. OK, um, and so we can do this for all actions. So I've discussed mainly passes, but we can do the same type of thing for interceptions, for headers, any type of action which is recorded. We use data from Opta, but we can do that for any particular um, action that's recorded on the field, and we can assign a value to those, uh, to those actions. Good, so three spatial principles of football. I've got one that is pass impact. I still need to find something for pass probability, and I need to find something for pitch control. Now let's, let's think about the first one of these. Let's think about pass probability. Now for our pass probability model, I'm not going to go into all the details about this, but what we did is we followed a physics-based approach. And again, this is based on work initially by William Spearman, um, who now works for Liverpool. But then um, Fran Peralta, uh, implemented a lot of this and made a few small adjustments. But he basically, now I say I've got one totally random equation in the middle of this, but he basically built up a physics-based model for the motion of the ball, for the motion of the players, which he could then use to work out the probability that the ball was intercepted. And that's what this, this, um, this shows. It said, if a pass comes from here, for a series of different points, what what Fran's algorithm does is it calculates the physical trajectory of the ball, it calculates the physical of the player, and sees can the player manage to inter intercept the ball, or which player is more likely to intercept the ball at various points. So again, if you want to look at it, yeah, I've put the reference here so you can actually look at, look at the paper, but the idea is to use physics to solve this problem rather than to use a statistical model. And I think, I think, I think this is, I always find this is a very interesting um, payoff here because you can of course try to do a machine learning approach to this type of uh, type of problem but it's very very difficult with tracking data because it's very complicated and I think for this particular type of approach is much better to build up a physics-based model of how the ball moves there's limitations to it um, we can't solve everything but it it seems in practice that these types of physics-based approach tend to be more successful than the machine learning approaches to this type of problem. You can ask me questions about that later. Um, okay, so let me just give an idea, uh, idea of how this uh, of how this works. This is an attack by Hammerby, and uh, that's a pass made um, by Alex Kaczynicic. And this pass was discussed in depth by the, um, the trains oh. Alex after the match. Because if you look at it carefully, you'll see that Vida Kjartansson is coming here on the right and the ball doesn't go um, through to him. So he was quite open for a pass, which arrive at him and the pass went off to, to another player as well. And it wasn't a su successful pass. And so we can actually use Fran's model to analyze this. And this is what Fran's model says. It says, here is the pass probability when Alex has got the ball here. And there is a lovely green area here showing that he could have passed to Kjartansson and Kjartansson had more speed so he would have got to the ball. The pass that he chose to make, even if he got it there, it had quite a low probability of success that Moyo would get to the ball there. So what we can do with this type of model is we can actually work out the success of passes in various situations and see if they work out or not. And in this case, probably it's the wrong in fact, quite definitely, it was the wrong um, choice of pass. You can actually use the model to show that this would have been the best, the best pass choice. So that's our pass probability model. I went over that very, took like, I don't know, nine months of Fran's life to develop, uh, but there we go. And what we've got left is pitch control. So how do we do that? Well, pitch control, um, I'm going to, start with an example from Barcelona because this is one of the things that I described in my book um, Soccermatics which Patrick mentioned at the start. This is a goal from Barcelona. If I go I'll show the goal one more time I don't know how well these videos are coming out but um, this is a goal from Barcelona and what I really liked when I started to analyze football is seeing the space that Barcelona create and you can actually do this 
by creating a Voronoi diagram. So at the bottom here, these are the two passes, the first pass from Messe to Xavi and back, then the second pass to Messe to Pedro and back. And you can make a Voronoi diagram, which divides all the areas into the space that's nearest to the particular players. And you'll see this is a Voronoi for Barcelona, but you'll see that the opposition players are on the edges of the Voronoi diagram. And this allows Barcelona to find good passing alternatives to each other. And this is the really nice result here is that the jewel of the Voronoi diagram is the Deloine triangulation, which tells you the most efficient way to, it's the passes between the, the, the individual players. And so by opening up more and more space, Barcelona can also open up passing opportunities between the players. And so Voronoi diagrams are the, the first kind of starting point, and I wrote a lot about this in Socomatics, for understanding the spatial structures that in particular, when you're playing the ball along the ground, this sort of tiki-taka style of football that it was called at the time, it really describes those types of spatial structures. And what I thought was very nice is I went down to Barcelona, now this was a year and a half ago. Um, I was very lucky enough to, I was lucky enough to be invited to make a documentary about um, Lionel Messi and I got uh, nice, nice seats to watch him, watch him play. And I also got a chance to go to La Masia, where I met um, Javier Fernandez, who I've mentioned a couple of times. And I found out that, well, he wasn't using Voronoi diagrams because it was too simplified, but he was using another model called pitch control, which basically includes not just the nearest position to the ball, but in velocity of the various players. So in this example here, we have all the Barcelona players um, are in this sort of Barcelona color. And the areas which are green are areas where a Barcelona player would get to first if the ball was randomly dropped at that point. And that's what pitch control is. It's the um, probability of uh, the, a particular player getting to the ball first. So red is controlled by the opposition, green is controlled by Barcelona in this. To read more about it, you can have a look in, um, in, in Xavier's um, paper, Wide Open Spaces. And this was this is really lovely stuff to see that um, they were actually putting this kind of this kind of thing into practice um, inside the inside Barcelona. If you want to know more about pitch control, um, we've actually been making a series of videos, a totally incredible uh, video by William Spearman here explaining all of the principles. Has done a series of videos. I think the next one is coming out tomorrow, looking at. Um, how you create a pitch control model. And I've done a sort of more popular video showing how we've used pitch control at Hammerby to describe um, how different players control space. So, so you can check out those, um, those videos. I'll, I'll, I'll write all the links and stuff like that into the, into the YouTube thing at the end. So now we have our three spatial principles of football. We've got pass probability, pass impact, and control. We've got mathematical models for all of them, plus some sort of grounding of each of these in how we play football. Um, the next thing we need to do, we need to look at our three playing principles for football. How do we combine these spatial principles with the playing principles and how coaches talk about football and how players think about football? Now, here it's always nice to take clips of Barcelona because you often get a lot of perfection of these, these types of things. But this is a lovely, um, lovely example where the left winger here runs to open up space for the left back. So the run here, this run takes a defender out of the way, which then opens up space for the left back to come in. And this is a lot of what, um, well, for this style of attacking football, these types of disruptive runs are really, really important because they use open up space for other players and allow, allow passes to be created. So when we use the models that we've been looking at, the spatial models, to describe these types of runs. And it turns out, well, yes, we can. First, we can look at it from this perspective. This is looking at the pass probability. And you'll see that the green areas are where the pass can be made. The red areas is where the pass can't be made. And as the left winger runs this direction, taking the defender with him, it opens up space for the left back to run into this um, this. Them. And so you can actually measure how they're opening up space for, the, for each other using the past probability model. 
Yeah, and so just to reinforce this, the, what we would say in this, this type of disruptive run, this is happening in the mutual help zone because you can think of actually probably in, in increasing in the past probability of things is something around about here you want to do the mutual help zone. Um, and what we could also see is after the run had been made, maybe I'll just show the video. I, I want you to um, just look at how the left winger stops here. So maybe I can pause it. So he just stops. He makes his run first and then he stops. And it might be, you might be thinking, first of all, maybe he's just being lazy or maybe he thinks that he's done his job and he's thinking about what to do out, uh, next. But what we actually found is at that particular point when he stops, um, this is the real thing. This is the real pitch control that he has. And this is the optimal pitch control that he has. Although they, these plots seem to be, I've put them at the wrong, uh, the move in position, you actually see that the optimal pitch control, thinking one second into the future, is very, very close to the real pitch control. So by doing this running first, creating the space, and then stopping, you first maximize pitch uh, passing probability. And then afterwards, in the stopping movement, you uh, maximize pitch control. And this is a sort of maximization decision that's going on all day long for these football players. They're trying to think about, well, what am I trying to maximize? And when we're observing it um, using our spatial principles, we can, we can think, well, actually, maybe they're just maximizing these three different things. Sometimes they're maximizing pass probability. Sometimes they're maximizing pitch control. And sometimes they're um, maximizing impact. And that's what we decided to formulate a model. And so now I'm finally going to get to the model that we formulated. We looked at the following idea. We said, if we want to maximize pitch control, pass impact, or pass probability one second into the future. So this idea also comes from how football players talk about how they think. Often football players, they admire each other for their ability to think more than a few seconds into the future. And so people say things like, oh, Messi can think 10 minutes into the future. I think that's probably exaggerated. But a good football player can see two or three or maybe four or five seconds into the future about what's going to happen. And the idea of our model is if a particular player can a second into the future where everyone else is going to go, and then he wants to maximize these three principles, pitch control, pitch impact, or pass probability, where should he go? And that then allows us to actually build a simulation model of how a player behaves one second into the future. And so we made that model. We said, this a focal player knows what's going to happen one second into the future. What does he do to maximize these three different criteria? And we are actually looked at a combination of them. We didn't just look at um, one at a, well, we looked at one at a time, but we also looked at past probability times pitch impact. So this is a point-wise multiplication of those two. If you think of those two heat maps, they're both probabilities. We multiply them together point-wise, and we have this uh, new surface, which is past probability times pitch impact. We can do past probability times um, pitch control and so on, or we can have all three of them. And then we analyzed how the players um, in Hammerby were acting um, in the final third of the pitch for two games, one versus Jutabori and one versus Malmö. We also compared to another model, which was the current position model. So where a player is at this, at this um, point. Good, I'm going a little bit over time. So I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to get through this and I'm going to tell you one, one last thing and then I'll, I'll be done. Uh, Okay, so let, let's get to this. So decision making, this is in a particular situation, which was in the figure at the start. This is Tankovic. He has to make a decision where he's, uh, where he's going to run to. It's Vida who's got the ball in this particular situation. And what we can look at is we can compare the optimal positioning with their actual positioning. So in this particular situation, Tankovic took a run towards the box. And from a pitch control point of view, this isn't the optimal thing to do because there's already five players there controlling this area. 
there's two Hammerby players who can come in and control some of the area over here. So what he should really do from a pitch control perspective is take that run. And you see that here by comparing his real positioning, he made the run in here with his, um, um, with his simulated positioning. If he was trying to optimize pitch control, he should have run to here because then control all of this area. So we can actually compare the optimal positioning, the shaded ones, with the real positioning suggested from the model. And we found that <clears throat> this model was far from perfect, but it did pick out one, um, a few things. So when, when we were playing against Malmer, we compared PP times PI, which turned out to be a really, really good predictor of how, well, not really good, a reasonable predictor of how the players who were nearest to the ball act. So attacking players nearest to the ball, remember this is the mutual help zone, they tended to maximize PP times PI. So that's the probability of getting the ball plus the uh, multiplied by the impact of getting that pass. And you can think of that, that's a very natural thing to want to um, maximize because that's the probability of both success multiplied by the probability of it then goes on to lead to a goal. And if you multiply those two things together, it's a natural thing so that was a very nice result. What was rather more surprising and maybe slightly disappointing is that pitch control didn't really rank. If you just uh, if you just stayed in the same position, if you simulated the players just staying in the same position, it got better predictors of what the players actually did. So it seemed that the players weren't following pitch control as far as we could see in our simulation. This was a game against Malmö. The results were somewhat weaker in the game against Göteborg. Possibly. Um, we were more effective in our attacking. There was less, less need to do more complicated attacking in that match. But we can start, and this is now work in progress, but we can start to actually compare our model output with, the, um, uh, with what the players actually do. Right, so I'll just um, say a few, a few minutes here at the end, because although one of the really important things about this project is we've had a chance to present these figures to the as we go along and to the coaching staff and really work together with them. So I just wanted to show you one Hammerby goal, really nice Hammerby goal. Oh yeah, this is us working together. They've been really nice. I've been allowed to go along and um, collect balls at the training sessions and um, uh, work very closely together with them. We've been looking at analyzing during the games. Um, and then we work very closely together with the players showing them these pitch control figures and so on. We also worked with, together with Signality who collect the data. And so that's been a really interesting experience to me. For me, as I said at the start, the, the Hammerby have been very welcoming um, and giving me access to, to do this type of thing. But let's, let's have a look at um, one goal here. I, I think this is a really nice goal that sort of summarizes a lot of what's nice about pitch control. So I'll pause at this point. See, Moyo um, Tankovic gets the ball back here outside the box. And he starts an attack here, which um, goes down the middle of the pitch. But you see, all the time, we're opening up more and more space. Nico comes down left, back in. And it's actually Moyo who got the ball back in the first place who goes on to score the goal. So I think it's a lovely example of controlling space outside our own box getting the ball back and then controlling the space in the opposition's box. So let's have a look at this from a, um, a, a pitch control point of view. I'm gonna let this run, I'll pause it there. So you see, we've got reasonable control outside our own box. So we've got control inside our box, but we've also got control outside our penalty area. And that means, this is exactly what happens is the ball bounces out somewhat at random from the box. And one of our players, in this case, Moyo, because he's back here controlling this area, can pick it out. And then you actually see that Nico is already in space straight away. So at this stage, Nico is out here, opened up a nice space over on this side. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, you can see both Alex has got space in front, of it, in front of him and Aaron has opened up space on the other side. So while, when we're in the point of attacking, we've got control over both of these areas on either side. A ball comes out and it's a nice pass into the middle where um, he manages to, to score the goal. <coughs> Excuse me. 
it's hard to talk non-stop for 45 minutes. Um, so you see here that we control in the dangerous space outside and then we're opening up dangerous space as we go along. We can also look at this from a past probability point of view. The first, uh, the first decision, Alex had a 60% chance of making that pass to Moyo, a 98% out to Nico. He then makes that pass. There's basically two passes. Now there's a 65% chance to Moyo, 95% <clears throat> chance out there to Aaron, but Moyo is in the better scoring position and it's a goal. Okay, finally, I will say one last thing. I, this is what I think the future battle of football analytics will look like. So I think there's a lot of stuff about football analytics now with regard to scouting and event and just basic use of numbers. And, and that's, been, that's been very nice. But I think that more and more, there will be a sort of tactical battle which involves mathematical modeling and input from coaches. And so I've written down this, this is maybe a controversial thing, but you can challenge me at the end. I have this idea of a fundamental um, master equation for football. And this is also an idea that Will Spearman has been talking about and um, Xavier Fernandez has also been talking about. But the idea is that you can break everything that happens down into three probabilities. The probability that a player chooses an action and <clears throat> you can have it multiplied by the probability that that action is successful, and then the probability that that particular action leads to a goal. And this basically turns, in, turns a lot of footballing problems into Markov decision problems. It also turns them into self-propelled particle type of models. And it gives us various modeling ways of looking at how the movements and actions of the players can change their probability of scoring. And I think a lot of the challenge or the interesting things will be in football analytics will be about who has got the best model of these types of things. So I've described how we use pitch control and pass probability and so on, but there are other ways of modeling football. And so some have better models than others, some teams will have better models than others. Some coaches will be more engaged in using this type of stuff than others. And there'll be a kind of analytics battle which is very much concentrated on who has got the best model and the best tactical understanding of, of football. So that's maybe a sort of controversial look into the future, but that's how I see the future of this type of stuff. And with that, I will say thank you very much um, to you for listening and for, um, yeah, uh, oh, and most of all to Fran, Javier and Pablo um, for working together with me on this really interesting project. Thank you. Um, this is where I find out I've been talking to myself for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, um, well, will we open up the Zoom chat for questions if somebody would like to um, like to ask any questions? If you, you can either use the hands up or you can just put your microphone on and, and ask me a question if you have one. Hi, David. Real, really nice talk. I gave you a, a virtual hand clap also. <laughs> um, I wanted to know a little bit more about, uh, you made this comment about that uh, the physics base. Oh, I've got to put my volume on, of course. Maybe someone is asking a question. Sorry, was anyone asking a question? <laughs> Or you uh, yes, off? I was. Okay, right. Sorry, I couldn't hear the question because I put my volume off because of my thing. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Uh, really nice talk. I gave you a virtual clap also okay thank you <laughs> i wanted to ask about this uh you you said that the physics based model would outperform machine learning based models for mm -hmm. the pass probability yeah so could you comment a bit more on that uh right the, the first reason is because the data um quality isn't high enough there's errors with the tracking <clears throat> um the tracking data uh, in particular with the ball. So the hardest problem is to track the ball. And that means that it's very difficult to get a good model of the ball. It just won't, uh, won't work very well. Um, so I think that's the major reason just now. As a more, um, yeah, I think, reason, but I also I think it will go further than that. I'm, I'm a big 
because most of my modeling work builds on constructive types of modeling. And when I worked in animal behavior, we actually found that a lot of these sorts of constructive models where you build a model of how things interact, they perform better than machine learning models because you can more naturally put in the information of things you know about animals or you know about football players or you know about the, the movement instead of getting the machine to try and learn these things from scratch. <clears throat> so I think, the, yeah, there's two answers. Uh, one, is, one is on a practical level um, just now with the data, but also I'm a great believer, um, and I know you're all in the machine learning department, so now I work in a machine learning department too, but um, I know you're, um, I'm a great believer that it's uh, constructive models are always the best starting point when you totally understand things, then you can maybe use a machine learning model to sort of um, fill in the details. That sounds actually nice for me. I mean, not that the data is not good enough, but because I, I'm, a, I'm actually a knowledge representation person. Okay, yeah. So it seems that maybe a combination of machine learning and knowledge representation may be the way to go at, uh, at some point. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I mean, and, and that's, that was really my, for some reason, it's just, I mean, maybe if I put it on to me and that that was my um that was lots of my experience from modeling collective animal behavior there was a lot of sort of hype about 10 years ago about will or we'll just do machine learning to understand animal behavior and unfortunately I th still think there's a few too many people just working on machine learning models I think that there's so much knowledge to be gain from biologists, for example, about their study species. And there's just so much knowledge to be gained from football coaches. And I'm gaining that knowledge all the time. And then the challenge is how to turn that knowledge into a mathematical model. Um, so yeah, I, 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 well, I'm just, I'm not providing much evidence for my statement other than my experience of working, working with these different types of things. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so a re re really interesting talk. So I wanted to listen if you could give a look. So, I mean, you've been working with Hammarby, it sounds like. Mm. So how how have you been able to sort of communicate to them to convince them that, okay, these mathematical models are actually use, useful for them? And is it the coaches that are easiest to talk to or is it the players? It's a mixture, really. Um, I'm interested actually because we, uh, Doggins and Neate are going to publish an article on, on Saturday about, um, about my work at Hammerby and how, and different things that we've been doing at Hammerby and, uh, Stefan Billborn's been interviewed for it, it too. So I'm very interested in what he says about, uh, our work together because he might tell me one thing and, uh, say something else when he gets asked about it. But I think, I think it's, um, uh, so the first, my first, basically i was there for a two year i'm there for a two year project and unfortunately that's been really disturbed the first year was really about me learning things and there um stefan yorke and pablo were just incredible um i went along to the trainings i'd learned stuff from stefan all the time he'd explain various things to me and then he'd also we could sit down and we could talk and look at these types of things together and talk about tactics together so it was mainly just talking about football and they were very generous with their time then we got to the stage where we started to work together with the players and present things. And there also, I think Stefan was very open because he allowed myself and Pablo or just myself um, and now also Fran and we have a master's student to talk to the players about these things. And so we took clips to talk about that weren't related to the matches we just played. And again, we just looked at the data. We looked at these pitch control videos, the pass impact things. I explained various things to do with expected goals to them. And they discussed what they took away from these types of videos. So I didn't try to act as a, a guided coach. It was more of a guided discussion around the use of data. And I've only heard positive things from them, actually. I, I wouldn't say that maybe there's a couple of them who try to escape and not come to the meetings we have. I don't know. But um, I've only, uh, otherwise, I've just had heard positive things from them that they do enjoy seeing it in a different way and it gives them a different way a more neutral way to discuss things <clears throat> and we had this one one meeting before the corona thing 
the defenders um, looking at how we defend the box. And um, what we did is we set it up, we showed them a video first, then we showed them a pitch control, and then we asked them to discuss it. And David Feldman was saying like, please just give me the answer. I want to know the answer. And what he meant is he wanted to know what the computer simulation said. And so they, they can see these things as a sort of more neutral answer to the, to the types of problems that are being um, set for them. Okay. Yeah. No. 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 Interesting. And 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 you provided the future in in terms of breakdown of of three three factors. So so which of those three factors do you think are easiest to manipulate as a, as a team or as a player? Um, I think the one that we and is actually interestingly as I've talked about at least today, but the one that. Um, the one that I have maybe had the most influence with is the pit ball, because that's the furthest from the action. So when you've got the, there's not much a mathematician can say about staying on the ball when you're in the intervention zone. Also those types of disruptive runs that I've looked at today, they come very natural to a football player. That's something that they've been doing since they're sort of 11, 12, they start to understand that they can open up space for each other. So where we've been able to have most impact, and this is where I've had the most interesting discussions with Stefan, is that we can look at how we control space further away from the, um, so if we're attacking in their final third, how should the other players control space? So if we lose the ball, we don't suffer a counter attack and um, we also can restart another attack on them. So the, that's the place I think we can have the most influence, although I've talked about it at least today for some reason, is in the cooperation zone, the zone which is furthest away from where the ball is. What should you do in those types of situations? Okay, no, in, 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 interesting. And uh, fi final question to follow up on mm -hmm. that. So, so, so I mean, here you focused on football. So, so which other sports do you think that pitch control is, uh, is most most useful for is is it these sort of slow moving sports or do you think mm. they're applicable for faster sports like I, ice hockey as well i'm not sure i can answer that question so football is the only sport i know anything really so um uh table tennis maybe but um <laughs> <laughs> so um i'm not sure i can answer i think i like football because it is sort of the most mathematical of sports um, because it's got the most moving parts, mo moving it. Maybe bandy, as if we're in Sweden, that I could see as being more mathematical than football. But apart from that, I think there's fewer players in ice hockey, though there is, and there's the major problem is like, what's a possible move? What's a possible trajectory that you can take? Basketball has, has fewer players as well, but it has more dimensions. So in some ways, it's more complicated in that way. So... I think that the the idea of breaking it down into spatial principles would be the same in other sports, in other team sports, but I think those spatial principles would be um, somewhat different. And the expected possession value, the, the pass impact, that's very heavily used in uh, basketball. Um, and the biggest analytics contribution in really has been this idea of throwing three points um, uh, trying to throw three pointers that you should get the ball back behind the line so you can throw three pointers and I had a very actually interesting uh, discussion with da uh, Daryl Morey about this to do with he thinks that in football all the players should, you should basically just have a few players in the box in your own box and you play the ball out from the goalkeeper then you just kick the ball really hard over um, to running forwards that are running onto the ball and this should be sort of tactical evolution. I don't think we're ready for that type of um, uh, tactical evolution. When I told this to Yoki, he was like totally shocked and was saying that Daryl Morey had already ruined um, ruined basketball and couldn't come along and ruin football as well. So I think there's, there's different, different analytical approaches in different sports. Uh, no, thanks, thanks. Re 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 really interesting uh, insights there. May I follow up on Niklas's first question? Yeah, sure. While well, you were talking about working together with Hamabi, mm. my guess is that it, one of the more difficult parts is figuring out what to tell and how to tell. So do you have any recommendations about that? Uh, how to select the, the data or, or what you want to show, but also how to visualize? Or... 
Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And I, I think a little bit how I how I said that we've been working is we take um, we uh, so it's really about hearing what um, Stefan is talking about with the players, what he thinks is an important aspect of how they're playing, and then trying to do some sort of variation of that, which is a bit more neutral. And so that's the way that we've been working. And I think that's because it's early stages, it would be a really bad idea to say we're suddenly going to have like totally mathematical tactics. So the way that we've been working is to have it in a much more discursive <clears throat> type of way that find out what they think about this data and how they interact with that data. And so we have a master's student who's doing exactly that project. He's, he's made actually a sort of 200 different situations Oh, uh, no, I should, I should simplify this. He's actually six different types of situations. Um, some of them are crosses into the box. Some is how we defend when we're attacking. Some of them are how we, how we make attacking passes. And then those are the basis of, around which we have the discussion. So it's not detailed tactical discussions. That's definitely Stefan's, um, uh, Stefan Billborn's responsibility to make that. Uh, at this point, I mean, I, I, I'm never going to be doing these tactical discussions, but I do think that they they might be more and more informed by data in the future. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah, I was writing down. So thanks. Any more questions? None from the Zoom, it seems. Okay. So I will thank you. Look, um, I don't. Think you're, really yes, nice you talk. can say thank you. I said I'd answer questions if there was any on the. Uh, there doesn't on seem YouTube. to be many on the. Uh, um, uh, um, the YouTube people who are watching on the YouTube, but uh, if you do have a question, you can you can put it in. Now it just says hello. <laughs> um, good. Well, uh, thank you for having me thanks a lot yeah thank, thanks for pre presenting Re really interesting stuff <laughs> get these little clap things <laughs> this is the most awkward bit about these online seminars because you don't i can't see any of you i'm just sitting here at, <laughs> hello <laughs> oh good i'm getting all of these online clap things great thanks <laughs> Oh, and some chats. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I will um, um, I will stop this um, now, and um, hopefully, I'll see you in real life at some at some stage in the future. Bye bye. <laughs>